today we're going to be talking about the scientific method, how to do a science fair project. When I start uh, teaching my students about uh, how to do a science fair project, I basically have like a part one and a part two. Uh, the first part is determining a problem uh, and finding more information about it and then making your hypothesis. Once you've done that, then you go on to part two. And that's more of setting up the experimentation and making your conclusions from your experiment. And, and then writing this all up as one whole paper at the end. First step is to select a topic, something that you might have a question about. And there are several ways that you could approach this. You could either visit online to, uh, and explore some science uh, projects online. Uh, a good place to start would be sciencebuddies.org. Or you could just write down topics that are interesting to you and, um, and just hold them and, and see which ones you know, come to the forefront as something you might be interested in. Or thirdly, you could actually talk to other people. You could talk to your teachers, talk to your parents, uh, talk to a neighbor down the street that you know who uh, is, a, say, a forester or somebody who works as an engineer and interview them to come up with some possible topic ideas. Once you've selected a topic that you'd like to do uh, a project about, then you have to actually go a little bit deeper. You have to look at a problem that you're trying to solve. And in order to do that, you need to state the problem in the form of a question that can be answered through experimentation. For example, let's say you, are, um, you really love skateboarding and you would like to do something um, that is related with skateboarding. And so you want to look at ways that you can either make a skateboard go faster, or maybe you could uh, test the friction rates of different types of wheels that are on a skateboard. And you could uh, propose a, a problem, and then you could uh, have a possible solution to that problem by testing it through either changing the wheel types or uh, seeing uh, what surface makes the skateboard go faster. Once you've stated the problem, then you have to do some background research. This is sort of like doing uh, the background of a report where you're trying to find as much information about that topic so that you can make an informed hypothesis, an informed possible solution to the problem. And so you have to gather information, whether it's online, in encyclopedias, in the library, uh, from experts, from your teacher. Any resource uh, is a viable one, one that you can use and you want to make sure that you keep documentation of that. Another thing about the background information is that this will actually become the introduction of your paper. The introduction is sort of, uh, could be anywhere depending on what level you're at, but if you're just starting, it might be four to eight paragraphs about your topic. Starting with very broad, what is the, the problem that you are trying to determine, uh, and giving some background about that, if you're working with bridges and you want to explore the different types of bridges, bridge designs to see which one will hold the most uh, load, then what you need to do is first find out what kind of bridges there are out there. What are the designs and basic shapes of these bridges? And so you have to do a little bit of background research to find and then pick the ones from your reading that you think would be the ones that you would like to test and to explore. Then the last part of that introduction should be the purpose of this research is to uh, determine which is the fastest, which is the farthest, which is the best, uh, and end that paragraph with the purpose, the hypothesis, and, uh, and then you're ready to begin your methods. The next step is to um, write your hypothesis. A hypothesis is a possible answer to a problem or a possible solution that can be tested with an experiment. So it's very important that you state your hypothesis in such a way that it can be tested. A personal pet peeve of mine is to say that a hypothesis is an educated guess because scientists try to eliminate as much guesswork as possible by doing that background research, computer modeling, laboratory experiments, and observations before they even begin an experiment. So I suggest very strongly that when you are defining a hypothesis that you are stating that it is a prediction that could be tested or it's a possible solution to a problem and not an educated guess. An example of a hypothesis, let's go back with my original 
uh, comment about skateboarding is if I was testing the different types of brands of wheels on skateboards for their um, speed, then my hypothesis would be brand A, brand B, or brand C would be the fastest uh, for the skateboard. And, um, and then I would only know through testing those three different types of wheels which would be the fastest. And you are making a prediction based on what your knowledge is and what you've learned about skateboards and the wheels, which would be the fastest. When starting a science fair project, you have to realize that there's uh, basically six steps that are part of the project. From the determining the problem, to gathering information about the problem, to making a hypothesis for that problem, then you need to set up the experiment, perform the experiment, and make observations. And from those observations that you record, you're going to analyze your data and come up with a conclusion, which will either support your original hypothesis or your evidence does not support your original hypothesis. And if it doesn't, how would you restate that hypothesis to try it again the next time? Now you have a, a pretty clear focus. And if you can state your purpose uh, in one sentence, then you pretty much know the focus of your experimentation. Uh, it pretty much is dictated by what you have stated in your purpose. So if it's very clear, you have no problem turning that purpose into a, a question uh, that then can become the title of your project. Once you have your hypothesis stated, now you need to think about, how am I going to set up doing the experiment? And we call this usually procedures and methods. And what you need to do is you have to sort of think through. So some of this might be trial and error. And you find out, oops, I sort of forgot to write that step down. You have to go back and add it in. So when you are actually exploring your procedures, you want to make sure you list very clearly exactly what kind and the amount and the brand name, if possible, of all the materials that you're going to have to collect in order to do this experiment. And you have to be very clear with your step-by-step -step directions so that anybody, brother, sister, mother, dad, could come by and follow your directions given the same set of materials and be able to duplicate your project exactly because you were that clear in your directions. Absolutely everything that you do has to be logged into a journal. I don't care what kind of notebook you use, but it all has to be handwritten and recorded in there from start to finish. So from the point at which you start your experiment uh, or you're d gathering your ideas for a science fair project to the completion, it all has to be done into a logbook of some kind. It cannot be typed up and taped into your book. That is not a clear record from beginning to end. And every entry, no matter even if you did nothing that day, every entry has to have a day in it. It has to have a date. So you want to make sure that you are logging in anything that you do regarding your science fair project into a logbook. As you're ready to test your experiment, you want to make sure that you have your logbook handy so that you can record the time and the dates of all your trials, all your results, and include anything that you do wrong. Make sure that you, if something went wrong, you include it so that that data might not be legitimate data, but there is a reason for it. Uh, like the wind came by and blew your airplane uh, off track, uh, something like that. So make any accurate recordings as you go along. When it comes to analyzing your data, the, the saying a picture is like a thousand words. People really are able to understand graphs and charts so much better than seeing thousands and thousands of numbers. A lot of numbers sort of throw us all off. And so you need to take those numbers and put it into the form of a picture so that people can see, you can see the results better. You can see if there's a significant difference between trial A and trial B and trial C, or were they pretty much the same um, on average? And so you wanna make sure that you are able to take your data, put a value to it. It has to have a numerical value, even if you're uh, seeing which is the uh, how many people prefer Coke to Pepsi? You want to make sure you have numbers. 97% prefer this to 3% prefer that. Uh, so you need to have it in some measurable result. Uh, and if you have a problem with that, talk to your teacher. The last part of the science fair project is your conclusion. And this is where you sort of get to reflect back on the entire project. Um, 
you want to state from looking at your data results whether it supported your hypothesis or not. And if it did, fine. And if it didn't, what were some of the issues that came into play that caused you to uh, not get the results that you were wanting? Uh, wanting? And did, were you able to um, come up with a new hypothesis that you could test at a later date? You'll find many of the science fair project winners that uh, move on through junior high to high school actually take a very simple idea in sixth or seventh, eighth grade, and they grow on that same idea and they expand on it, and they're the ones oftentimes that become your grand champion winners, so or get scholarship money from um, their uh, regional science fairs. So once you're done, you want to also look back to say what were some of the things that influenced your results, um, and and it's fine to have a science fair project that fails, that doesn't come out. We don't want you to rechange your hypothesis to make it look like your uh, science fair project worked. We want you to be honest with your evaluation. And if yours, did, you know, a belly flop that didn't turn out at all like you like, that's wonderful as long as you show that and explain it and, and say, what would you do again if you were able, knowing what you know now, what would you do again to make this a better project? What could you do to, what would be a new hypothesis that you would state? So once you have your conclusion done and you've uh, thought reflectively what you could have done better, that's a great springboard for you to go on for a next year project, whether your school requires it or not. You as an individual, if you like science and engineering, you should constantly bug your teachers or bug your school district to be in the science fair so that you aren't deprived of having the scholarship money that's available for you locally or even internationally. I judged the International Science Fair this past year and I have to tell you, I was floored by the projects and how much money these, these students, 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds were getting, um, upwards of $50,000 in scholarship money. It is not something to just turn your head on, especially if you are interested in one of these fields. Ultimately, the science fair uh, and the scientific method are things that you can use outside of the field of science. Um, many students use this in history or criminology or in art for web designs and this sort of thing. It's important that you look at what there is in a problem. We all have problems. What do we know and how can we solve this problem? What are these issues and how can we attack them? And we, it's, if you are armed with knowledge, you've done your background research, and then you're willing to explore and test your ideas, I think you're much more successful in your life, whether it's in college, or whether it's in your home, or whether it's in your job. Just as a side note, some students want to do more of a historical research. For example, they would like, they're so fascinated by dinosaurs that they'd like to explore the different theories uh, behind the dinosaur's extinction. And so they might be comparing the different kinds of theories out there and what seems to have the most evidence uh, that is supported today, but they have never learned this, so this for them would be brand new. This is more of a historical research and not an experimental research project. And so I can tell you from a science fair um, side of it that although they could be stellar projects, they may not be um, like a first place winner, but it's, it's equally as an important one if it's an interest to the student. And so you're not really always trying to go for the first prize, but you do need to realize that if it doesn't have experimentation in it, that the judges generally uh, won't pick it as a first place winner. When it comes to doing science fair projects, it is imperative that the student pick a project that they are keenly interested in. If you don't have an interest in it, someone's telling you to do this project uh, on this particular topic, you have to work with it four to five months, and it can be, it can be a living nightmare, not only for the student, but for the parents who are trying to help that student at home. So it should be a genuine interest for the student, something that they would like to learn more about. And, and if it is a genuine interest, then they'll have a lot more fun doing it, and it won't be uh, a nightmare.